Welcome back, everyone. We are pleased to have Dr. Paul McRae join us today. Dr. McRae is a professor of pediatrics in the Division of Pulmonary Medicine and professor of microbiology and immunology at the University of Iowa. His scientific interests include cystic fibrosis, epithelial cell biology, innate immunity, host pathogen interactions, and the applications of gene transfer for lung diseases. His team used molecular genomics and bioinformatic approaches to discover novel secreted peptides and proteins with host defense functions in airway epithelia. He's investigating gene addition approaches for CF using integrating viral vectors, and more recently has applied this knowledge to investigate delivery of gene editing tools to the respiratory tract. We welcome Dr. McRae, who will present advances in gene therapy for cystic fibrosis. Welcome, Dr. McRae. Thank you very much. I'd like to thank the organizers and CFRI for giving me the opportunity to talk today and also uh, present a little bit of our, our work in this area. So let me advance the slides here, get this going. Uh, I have one disclosure that I'm a founder and scientific advisory board member for Spiroban Sciences, which is developing gene therapy for cystic fibrosis. So in this talk, I'm gonna give a brief overview about the molecular basis of CF lung disease. And then I will talk about gene addition and gene editing strategies for, for CF. And I will spend a good portion of the talk giving some examples uh, for, of ongoing work uh, by companies and, and individual labs. And we'll hopefully have time for some questions at the end. So I think we all know that cystic fibrosis is a multi-organ system disease uh, affecting the organs outlined here. It's an autosomal recessive disease caused by mutations in CFTR. Uh, infections and inflammation in the airway are the most life-limiting aspect of the disease. And most of the active gene therapies that are getting close to clinical trials are focused on what they could do for the lung. So thinking about what CFTR does, it's expressed in epithelial cells. Um, those cells, uh, it's encoded on chromosome seven. The messenger RNA is translated into a polypeptide and as it makes its way through the ER and the Golgi, uh, it gets further processed where it makes its way to the cell surface to serve as an anion channel where it's involved in chloride and bicarbonate secretion or absorption, excuse me. Um, so in doing so, CFTR regulates salt, liquid, and pH homeostasis uh, in those organs. So you've all probably already seen a figure like this. I just want to mention in particular that mutations uh, that are premature stop cod codon mutations or some splicing mutations create a situation where there's no or very little protein for any modulator drugs to act upon. And um, so in those ways, these are can candidates with uh, unmet needs where gene therapy could potentially play a role. So approximately 10% of CF patients have mutations that are unresponsive to modulator therapies. And some people do not respond well to the modulators or have contraindications and cannot tolerate the medications. So if we think about all of our current therapies, we're all familiar with, with these uh, type therapies in the, in the top here. And, and then we have the newer small molecule therapies, but there are other things in the, in the pipeline. And so I'm gonna focus on, on gene therapy here. So what is gene therapy? I thought it might be good to just have a definition to start out. So it's a treatment that adds a new gene or replaces or repairs a mutated or changed gene in cells to help prevent or treat a disease. So why do we think this could work for, for CF? Well, after the CFTR gene was discovered in 1989, within a year, it had been shown by two groups independently that if you put a normal copy of the CFTR gene into cells 
uh, with CFTR mutations, that it would complement this defect and restore the anion transport. Now, we're not sure exactly how many cells would need to be corrected to be uh, therapeutic, and, and studies suggest a broad range from 6 to 50 percent of the cells. Of course, 50 percent would be what we would anticipate perhaps in the setting of carriers of CFTR mutations. And importantly, uh, gene therapy is a mutation agnostic approach, so it should help all mutations uh, with associated with CF. So a little more background information. So, so how do we make a protein? Uh, CFTRs on chromosome seven, where the base pairs of the two strands of DNA are, are, are complemented, AT base pairs, GC base pairs. Uh, this transcription will make messenger RNA for CFTR, which is translated into a polypeptide and eventually into the complex CFTR protein, which makes its way to the cell surface. So if we think about genetic cargos, uh, first thing I wanted to touch on is how would we get them to a cell? So the delivery vehicle for genetic cargos, we call a vector. And the cargo space uh, in that vector is the packaging capacity or the amount of DNA or RNA or protein that could be carried by the vector. And the types of cargos we'll talk about include DNA, messenger RNA, and protein. So there's different cargos with different vectors. I wanna give some examples of vectors here. One you'll hear about is adeno-associated virus or AAV. Um, AAV is a non-pathogenic DNA virus. It exists as an episome or hangs out in the nucleus of the cell by the chromosomes. It doesn't integrate. Uh, the capsid or the protein coat on the outside of the virus determines what types of cells it can bind to and enter. And there are many capsid serotypes available and under study. AAV has a packaging capacity of about 4.8 kilobases of DNA. And by, uh, for reference, that's about the same size as the coding sequence of CFTR. And some of the cargos that you, you would hear about related to AAV are a gene expression cassette, which I'll explain in a minute, or uh, a homology-directed repair template or a DNA template for homologous recombination, which we'll also talk about. Another type of vector are lentivirus vectors. These are RNA viruses that convert their RNA genome into a duplex uh, DNA genome uh, that inserts itself into the host chromosome. So it, that's what we call integration. And this is an approach to achieve long-term gene expression. These vectors are being used in, in clinical studies for uh, immunodeficiencies, uh, and they're often used in CAR-T therapy. Um, they're generally made from a disabled human immunodeficiency virus, but there are also other flavors of this. The envelope glycoproteins on the surface of a lentivirus, which can be changed, uh, determine the cell targeting. And lentivirus vectors have a larger carrying capacity of eight or more kilobases of, of DNA. And they were typically used to carry a gene expression cassette into cells. Another type of uh, vector is a non-viral vector uh, called a nanoparticle vector. And these come in many flavors. Uh, one widely used type of uh, nanoparticle is a lipid nanoparticle, but there can be polymeric nanoparticles that use lipids and proteins and other components in their design and they can carry a variety of cargos, DNA, messenger RNA, and protein. And uh, an example that might resonate for everybody, the Moderna and Pfizer COVID-19 vaccines uh, are an example of delivering um, mRNA cargo in a lipid nanoparticle. So we, most of us have been exposed to this already. So uh, I wanted to talk for a second here about some of the cargos uh, from the perspective of 
a gene expression cassette. So what does that mean? So if this was an AAV vector, uh, you have double-stranded DNA, there's a promoter or a regulatory element that drives the expression of the CFTR gene. And then there's a polyadenylation signal at the end of it that terminates uh, after the full length uh, mRNA transcript has been produced. Another example of a cargo is messenger RNA or mRNA, for example, carried in nanoparticles like the example of the, the Pfizer vaccine. So this has a, these these are produced uh, by what's called in in vitro in vitro uh, transcription, um, and it makes uh, messenger RNA that looks very much like the messenger RNA that a cell might produce uh, in the process of making uh, CFTR normally. So a, a normal copy of the CFTR messenger RNA, for example, and other cargos that could be included in uh, are are those that have to do with gene editing tools. So uh, nucleases like CRISPR-Cas9 or zinc finger nucleases or talons, uh, base editors, which we'll talk about prime editors and donor templates for gene editing. These are all things that could be packaged and carried by various vectors. So how would we deliver these, these vectors? Currently, a major focus is on local delivery to the airways because this is the most feasible approach for gene therapy currently. And this is generally going to be achieved by aerosol delivery approaches. Ideally, we'd like to have a means to correct all the organs affected by cystic fibrosis. Uh, but we're not there yet in terms of how to do that. But one example that's out there is uh, Zolgesma, which is an FDA approved drug for newborns with spinal muscular atrophy. Uh, in this case, they're given intravenous AAV vectors that make their way into the motor neurons of the spinal cord. So there's an example of feasible systemic delivery to a compartment. And, and many groups are working on how this might be achieved for the organs affected by cystic fibrosis. So another thing we have to think about is where do we want these vectors to go? What are the cell targets uh, in the lung? Um, this slide uh, is a reminder of the complex architecture of the airways as we go from the trachea to bronchi to bronchioles to alveoli. And along the airways, there are different cell types in different regions that can serve as progenitors to make new uh, versions of those airway cells. Um, and one of the things we'll talk about are basal cells in the large airways. Uh, and I think uh, we'll also hear from uh, other speakers uh, about the small airway compartment. But for this talk, I'm going to focus on the surface cell types in the conducting airways that in the trachea, the bronchi, out to the small airways. So we have multiple cell types here. Uh, there are ciliated cells that are involved in mucociliary transport, secretory cells that make host defense proteins and secrete mucins, uh, goblet cells that uh, secrete mucins and other proteins. Uh, there's a rare cell called an ionocyte, uh, one in a hundred cells in the conducting airways or less. Um, and then uh, at the bottom of the cell layer is a basal cell. And we know from a number of studies that the basal cell is the progenitor cell type for all of these. So if you just grow basal cells in a, in a tissue dish, there's a way to make all of these cell types. Uh, they know how to do that. And another question is, where is CFTR in terms of these cell types? So secretory cells express CFTR, as do goblet cells. Ionocytes make the most CFTR protein, but again, they're a rare cell. Basal cells make a little bit of CFTR, and ciliated cells also make a, a very little amount of CFTR. So 
I also wanted to point out that these cells in a healthy airway are gradually turning over over time. So the surface cells, uh, we don't really know in humans how long they survive, but in animal model studies in mice, uh, the surface cells in the trachea turn over at an interval of maybe six months. And in the smaller airways, it could be a year and a half uh, how long lived they are. And when they turn over, the basal cells can create the progeny that regenerate those surface cell types. So in, in thinking about what's going on in the gene therapy world right now for CF, I thought it would be instructive to look at the foundation's therapeutic pipeline. So I just pulled this offline here. And here's a list of, of, of companies working on, on, on various technologies. Uh, over here, I've noted the technology platform. And in yellow, I've highlighted all of the projects that are fall in the umbrella of gene therapy. So for example, 4D Molecular Therapeutics has an AAV vector for gene addition. Uh, Arcturus is in preclinical studies with a nanoparticle to deliver mRNA. Carbon Biosciences is developing virus as a vector. This is a relative of AAV that has a larger uh, packaging capacity. Pioneering Medicines is working on a nanoparticle approach with a, a gene editing technology. Uh, Recode Therapeutics has a lipid nanoparticle, and their goal is to deliver mRNA. Saliagen has a lipid nanoparticle technology and, and hopes to deliver gene editing tools. And Spiroband Sciences is working on uh, developing an AAB clinical trial and also is studying lentivirus vectors. And uh, I've highlighted with the asterisk uh, those that are working on aerosol delivery approaches also. So now I wanted to give some examples of, of what's going on in, in, in preclinical and in one case, a clinical trial for, for gene addition first. So remember, gene addition is let's put a normal copy of the CFTR gene, uh, an expression cassette or messenger RNA into the cell to replace or, and complement the, the, the deficit. So the first one I want to mention is 4D molecular therapeutics and their AAB uh, technology. So uh, these are some slides from 4D Molecular Therapeutics. Um, they have a, an, a proprietary AAB vector that they've developed to target airway epithelia. And they have a construct of a promoter and a small mini gene uh, CFTR. In order to get CFTR to fit in an AAB vector with the necessary regulatory elements, a common strategy is to remove uh, the R domain from the CFTR gene, which allows you to uh, deliver uh, a gene that will form a, a channel that is constitutively open and functional. So their goal is to do an aerosol trial of this uh, A101 uh, vector and deliver it uh, to, the, to the airways. In their preclinical pre data that they've released, they show uh, samples in uh, non-human primate airways where they've delivered a reporter vector and, and show uh, the reporter expressed in the surface airway epithelia, in the trachea, bronchi, and they also see expression in the alveolar region. They, uh, in late March, they began a, a clinical trial with this vector expressing CFTR. So this is an open label phase one, two trial. Uh, this is for people that are over 18 years of age uh, with CF where both mutations are documented and they are ineligible for modulator therapy or for some reason are not taking modulator therapy. And they have two different vector doses that they they plan to do and then perhaps expand the dose based on the findings. So their primary endpoint is 
is safety, excuse me. So they, they want to make sure that this delivery uh, and the response is safe. And then secondary endpoints, they will look at FEV1. And this is the publicly available information about this, this trial. Another uh, approach for gene addition that's in development uh, comes from Arcturus Therapeutics. And their goal is to deliver a CFTR mRNA using a proprietary nanoparticle. So these are a couple of slides uh, from this group, from this company. So they have a mRNA replacement approach. So uh, like I showed earlier, they have, they make uh, CFTR mRNA. They have a pr proprietary lipid nanoparticle that they will deliver by aerosol. Uh, they have shown using uh, reporter studies that uh, they can see transduction of airway cells or delivery to airway cells across multiple species, shown here mice, rats, ferrets, and monkeys, uh, where the brown staining is evidence of mRNA expression. And here the, the, the green cells are evidence of mRNA expression in ferrets and brown staining for expression in non-human primates. They've also shown in ferret uh, cultured cells that have the G551D mutation that with different doses of this mRNA, low, medium, and high, they can see signatures for functional restoration of CFTR uh, shown here with a cyclic AMP agonist and a CFTR inhibitor. They can see a dose-dependent increase in the CFTR protein in human cells with the Delta 508 mutation. And when they measure chloride transport in human cells that have been complemented with different doses of this vector, they see a dose-dependent increase in uh, function. So these studies provide some preclinical evidence, uh, proof of concept, and they continue to work on moving this towards a clinical trial. I also wanted to talk about another gene addition approach taken by uh, Spirovant uh, Sciences, and this is CFTR gene delivery using an AAV vector. So in, in this study, an AAV capsid has been selected that has tropism for the surface cells of the airway. And uh, a gene expression cassette has been designed that is, will fit into this uh, vector with the regulatory elements, with the necessary regulatory elements. And this has efficient delivery to the cells of the lining of the airways. Um, and it's co-delivered with doxorubicin which enhances the, the escape of the vector from endosomal compartments so that it can make its, uh, its messenger RNA and protein. And in, in this uh, example, uh, a reporter vector expressing uh, a fluorescent protein called M-cherry was delivered to airway epithelia. And as shown here, uh, the M cherry expression is in multiple cell types, including ciliated and secretory cell types, and also uh, evidence that in, it's expressed in uh, basal like cells. And they have also looked at how this could restore function in primary human CF airway cells, in this case, derived from. Uh, a person who had two stop codon mutations. So in, in well-differentiated cells with those uh, mutations, the, this AAV vector was delivered with doxorubicin, and then they studied the uh, short circuit current or chloride transport uh, a week later. And they see a dose-dependent increase in the current from these cells. And Here's a benchmark of a non-CF cell. So they're able to achieve functional correction in, in CF airway epithelia 
and they they need to supply this augmenter doxorubicin uh, at the same time to get the function because in its absence they do not achieve CFTR correction. They've also tested uh, this vector in non-CF and CF ferrets. In this case, uh, the vector with doxorubicin was, was aerosolized to the animals, and they looked at two weeks and 12 weeks uh, after delivery and saw that there was durable expression of the mRNA from that vector. They also tested this in CF ferrets and saw similar levels of mRNA expression, suggesting that the CF airways uh, were not a barrier in this animal model. So now I want to move on and talk about some examples of, of gene editing. Probably heard a lot about CRISPR. It does seem like it's everywhere. So what are some of the cargos that we might use for gene editing? Um, here I'm giving examples of, of proteins that are used for gene editing. Uh, the first one is CRISPR-Cas uh, nucleases. And in, in this case, as a protein, it's called a ribonucleoprotein, which is the, the protein in gray, and it's guide RNA in pink here. So uh, the DNA, double-strand DNA is shown here in blue. The guide RNA directs this complex to a specific uh, zip code in the genome. And once this nuclease is in place, it cuts both strands of the DNA, making what we call a double strand break. And I'll come back to this in a minute. Another type of, of cargo is an adenine base editor or an ABE. And this is a modified Cas9 protein that will only cut one strand, as shown here. And it's been linked to an enzyme shown in red here called deoxyadenosine deaminase, which allows it to change uh, a nucleotide uh, in, the, in the genome. And another exciting uh, gene editing tool is called a prime editor, uh, which is a way to change more than a single nucleotide uh, in the genome. So here, a little more information on a CRISPR-Cas9 gene editing. So the Cas9 protein is in the light purple here with its guide RNA. Uh, this directs it to a location in the genome where a double-strand break is made in DNA. Now, once that happens, there's kind of two main pathways that people talk about. Uh, one way to repair it is the cell will, will fill in nucleotides, and you'll either end up with a, a disrupted sequence, or uh, uh, you'll either get a deletion or an addition, which will change the coding sequence in this region. This is a common way if people want to disrupt a gene or stop a gene from, expression, from expressing. You can deliver a nuclease, cut the DNA, and through this process, uh, essentially destroy the activity of that gene. But for the purposes of CF, that's not what we want to do. We want to repair the gene. So one commonly discussed pathway for this is called homology-directed repair. So in this case, you use the nuclease to make a double-strand break, and then using a vector, perhaps like AAV, you provide a, what's called a donor DNA sequence, which through a process called homologous recombination shown by these X's here, it, it allows the cell to repair this region or insert in the case of a mutation, the, the normal sequence instead of the mutated sequence and repair the gene. And you're gonna hear more about this in a talk uh, from Sriram, I think tomorrow. So I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on this, but their strategy is to take airway epithelial cells, correct them 
ex vivo or in tissue culture using a nuclease and a repair template carried by AAV. And then they're exploring ways that this might be able to be engrafted or put back in the patient. Now I wanted to talk a little bit about adenine base editing. This is something that, that we've been working on recently. So what's the rationale for this? If you look at all the mutations associated with disease in people, little more than half of them are point mutations or a single change in a gene. And if you look at all of these point mutations, in about half of the cases, if it was possible to change an AT base pair to a GC base pair, uh, you could you could repair that that sequence. And if you look at all the CFTR point mutations, about half of them could potentially be corrected using an adenine base editor. And specifically in the case of stop codon mutations or premature termination. Uh, mutations or the class one CFTR mutations, all stop codons have an A. So perhaps you could convert that AT pair to a GC pair. That's, that's what this is about. And in our studies, we've been focused on delivering this base editor as a protein, a ribonuclease protein or RNP. And we're interested in that because it, it has a rapid onset of effect and a transient uh, activity. So a little more about how this works. If here's the two strands of DNA, and here's here's an AT base pair where, in in this case, a stop codon mutation would occur. Um, the the ABE uh, will be directed to this site based on the proto spacer associated motif or PAM motif that the guide RNA recognizes. So the guide RNA directs it to this spot and parks the base editor at this specific location in the genome. And this uh, deoxyadenosine deaminase is positioned uh, by this complex so that it is near the A that you would like to change. And uh, the next step is the A is converted to an inosine by this enzyme and also there's activity of the Cas nuclease that creates a, a break or a nick in the opposite strand from where the editing is taking place. In the, in the next step, the, the DNA repair mechanism will install a C on the strand opposite the inosine. And then in a further DNA repair step, it will install a G uh, to replace that inosine. So you have changed an AT pair to a GC pair. Some other things we need to consider uh, in thinking about this for a, a particular target in the genome is, is there a suitable PAM motif that the guide RNA can bind to that will park these reagents near the mutation that you want to modify? So in this case, Here's a, a, an AT pair, and there's a, a window of a few nucleotides where the enzyme could, could work its activity. So there has to be a, a protospacer adjacent motif present in order to park these materials in the genome. There has to be an A within the editing window. And another consideration is if there are additional A's, uh, there may be bystander edits. Uh, so that's another consideration in using this technology. So for the, for the example here today, uh, we've done work looking at three different mutations, but I'm gonna focus on the work that we've done with stop codon mutation R553X. So, in the case of R553X, uh, here's, here's the mutation, here's the stop codon TGA, there's an A on this strand that we want to target. This is the base editing window, these numbers here. And here's the 
the PAM motif. So it's a what's called an NG PAM. And this is where that nick would take place in the in the CFTR sequence. So if if everything goes according to plan, we will convert this AT pair to a GC pair. So the first work we did with this, we used a base editor uh, in collaboration with the David Lu's lab um, that's called ABE 710. So to deliver this protein and the guide RNA, we used electroporation into CF airway cells. And then we grew them at an air liquid interface. And we used a couple models here, a cell line that has one copy of R553X and uh, primary cells that have uh, that are compound heterozygous. Uh, we could take those cells after base editing and look at function. We can also isolate the DNA and do next generation sequencing to look at uh, how well uh, the enzyme worked. So I want to give an example of the functional correction. So here's uh, no, no treatment. Um, here's a non-CF comparison where we add a cyclic AMT agonist and a CFTR inhibitor and measure the current here over time. And it, after treatment with the adenine base editor, we see uh, evidence of CFTR function. And when we look at that graphically over here on the right, looking at the current, uh, we, in, in multiple technical replicates, we see a range of correction, but uh, clear evidence compared to the untreated controls that were restoring uh, CFTR function. We also looked at this in primary uh, CF cells, compound heterozygote for 553X, and uh, saw a similar restoration of function. So we used a sequencing to look at the uh, editing efficiency. So remember, these are compound heterozygous. So in the mock, in 50% of the cases at that locus, uh, you see a GC pair. But after treatment with the ABE, uh, we saw 91% uh, GC pairs there. And in the case of the primary cells, it was a little less efficient, but 77%. And when we correct for the fact that this is a compound heterozygous mutation, in the, in the cell line, we had 82% uh, of those uh, alleles corrected. And in the primary cells, just over 50% of the mutant alleles corrected. So uh, to summarize this base editing study, for this, for this mutation, we were able to correct it at the DNA level and show uh, restoration of anion transport. And we saw, I didn't show all the data, but we saw precise editing of this mutation with negligible, negligible evidence of, of off targets or bystander edits. So what our current focus is, is to uh, look at different ways that we could deliver these materials uh, using viral vectors or non-viral methods, including a peptide delivery uh, approach that we're interested in. <clears throat> and we're also focusing on a newer generation base editor that uh, is, uh, the enzyme is much more active So to, to summarize the talk now, um, I think there are some questions that, that are quite important that we're only gonna learn the answers to by continuing to work in this area. So can we achieve CFTR gene correction in the target cells of interest, including the airway progenitor cells? Depending on the vector approach, such as an integrating vector, a lentivirus, or a base editor, for example, if you could target the progenitor cells and correct them or restore CFTR function, then all the new cells that that progenitor produces could potentially repopulate the airway with corrected cells. Another question depends on it is how long will the gene expression last after you deliver it? Um, it's going to in part depend on the efficiency of gene delivery and then how often these cells turn over. 
And there's really a dearth of information about cell turnover in the human airways. It's an area we need more information. Another question is whether correction of the surface epithelium will be sufficient to correct CF defects in the airways. I didn't talk about it, but underneath the surface epithelium, there are uh, submucosal glands, another uh, part of the airway that expresses CFTR and is very important in lung function. And finally, we, we want to know if immune responses will uh, be deleterious in response to delivery of these agents, or will they somehow prevent uh, repeat administration of these reagents if necessary? So this is a very exciting time. There are multiple gene therapy approaches under investigation, and we're going to learn about the efficiency of these new tools uh, through ongoing research. Uh, this includes work with viral and non-viral delivery strategies, focusing on topical delivery to the airways, and also uh, early stage studies developing uh, systemic delivery approaches. Also, our field in CF is gonna be informed by what's going on with uh, gene therapy in other genetic diseases. So we're kind of in a renaissance period with these new tools and technologies. And you know, we will learn things from other diseases. And, and finally, I think current uh, and future clinical trials are really gonna be where we learn the most information and form the field about what works and, and where improvements are needed. Uh, and uh, there's a lot of reason for optimism. We have, uh, we have early diagnosis through newborn screening in all, all states. We have an unprecedented opportunity to intervene early and delivery barriers increases disease advances. So uh, once we understand how to do this efficiently, we have great opportunity to do it early. And I'd just like to acknowledge uh, my collaborators and people in my lab and our funding sources. And I thank you for your attention. And I'd be happy to answer any questions. Dr. McCray, thank you so much for such a fascinating presentation. And I give you such credit for taking such a highly complex science and threading the needle to make it uh, relevant to everybody who's watching today. So thank you, that was, that was an art. <laughs> thank you. Um, so we do have some questions uh, from the audience, uh, starting with, if you deliver the mRNA therapy to the lungs, the patient will still have CFTR issues in all the other tissue, correct? Functional, functionally, you could have less respiratory symptoms, but still all the GI manifestations, is that true? Yeah, that's true. I, I think, you know, as I tried to convey today, the most practical way that we can deliver these tools is to deliver them to the airways. Uh, while we know that, you know, perhaps the lung disease is the most life limiting uh, problem with cystic fibrosis, I, I'm, I certainly don't want to pretend that uh, it's not important to correct other organs. Right now, I would say, we don't exactly know how to do that. So first goal is let's see if we can fix the lung disease with gene therapy. Next level goal is can we figure out a way to deliver these gene therapy tools to all the organs affected by cystic fibrosis? I think that's maybe the holy grail for gene therapy for cystic fibrosis, uh, but it's going to take work to, to get there. And if I could ask you to stop sharing your screen and then people can see you up sure. close. Thank you. Thank um, you. So another question, if you target the cells and correct it, will it be permanent change or only for one to two years, which I understand is the life of lung cells? Yeah, that's another really good question. It really comes down to what technology is being used. So for example, the AAV vectors that are in clinical trials, uh, will deliver the gene expression cassette and hang out in the nucleus of that cell. Uh, but as the cells turn over and divide, then 
the number of copies of that gene expression cassette will be diluted with each cell division. So it'll gradually go away, but these cells turn over slowly. So it could be that the effect could last for a year or, or for years. Uh, we don't really know at this point. I, I pointed out what we know about cell turnover in uh, mice. Uh, we don't really know in humans. It, they may turn these cells may turn over faster in people with chronic inflammation. But again, I think this is an example of where we need to take our our best tools, study them in people because that's the only way we're going to learn. It's going to take clinical trials. And that was a perfect segue because that was another question. Most of this is in preclinical trials. Is that true? But are there any in which people could participate? Yeah, excellent question. Right now, in terms of the specific area of gene therapy, the only active clinical trial is that one that I pointed out by 4D Molecular Therapeutics. If you search for that, you can find it at clinicaltrials.gov. And they started enrolling patients at the end of March. And I think there are about a half a dozen centers that are involved in that clinical trial. Um, the rest of the examples that I gave, either from biotech or from academic labs, are preclinical studies uh, with a goal of demonstrating efficacy and feasibility and working towards clinical trials. So, you know, we're we're still at the at the starting gates here in terms of advancing this. Focus on the future, our theme of the conference. Yeah. So somebody just wanted to clarify again that this is this therapy would be applicable to patients with rare or nonsense mutations as well. Yeah, definitely. And I think I think one of the you know kind of things that's lighting a fire under people working on gene therapy is the knowledge that there are people with CF who have mutations that the modulator therapies do not work for and and the Nonsense mutations are a very good example. So that last example I gave of adenine base editing is an approach to fix a stop codon mutation so that it now encodes, the codon will allow for the appropriate amino acid to be inserted into the polypeptide as CFTR is being made. So, and, and whether it's base editing or gene addition, these things will, I hope I would convey that they would help everyone with cystic fibrosis. Um, so, so these gene therapies are, in some cases, mutation specific, like the last example I gave. But in general, uh, the hope is that a strategy can be developed that would be effective for anyone with, with CFTR mutations. And seeing that there are you know, companies as well as then in academia, the, the research is being pursued. Is there a network of scientists that you're part of that you're all sharing what you're learning? Is there a unified effort to advance this? Uh, well, I mean, there, there, the foundation just held a meeting in, uh, in June, uh, you know, which was basically a big powwow of people from academic labs and pharma and biotech working on, on, on gene therapy, among other things. Uh, and there are initiatives uh, from the foundation to uh, you know, leverage funds to uh, encourage academic labs and uh, industry to get involved in this field. Um, and so I think you know, through those uh, conferences and networking, people are keeping abreast of what's happening. But a lot of stuff is happening, and it's happening very rapidly right now. It is so exciting. My daughter was diagnosed with CF in 1995. And of course, at that time, I said, oh, within five or 10 years, it'll be cured with gene therapy. And it's just so wonderful now to see this resurgence with this new, new technology and new capacities to advance the science. And so I thank you so much for being a part of this and a leader in this. I thank you for sharing your time and your expertise with us. 
I'm sure there'll be more questions that emerge post-conference, so hopefully we can continue the conversation and keep sharing this good news with the community. So thank you so much, Dr. McRae. Thank you very much. It's been my pleasure to have the opportunity to talk to you folks.